and girls, we are back with another edition of the Federalist Radio Hour. I'm your host, Ben Dominich. You can email us, as always, at radio at thefederalist.com. Follow us on Twitter at FDRLST. I'm here with culture editor Emily Jashinsky, and we are also joined by a great guest to mm. uh, sit down and have a conversation with today, Papa John. It is wonderful to meet you and see you here today. Uh, Emily, thank you, and Ben, thank you. Uh, I want to talk to you about a bunch of different things, uh, but first I want to talk to you a little bit about something that is near and dear to my heart, which is pizza. <laughs> um, I have to be honest, I probably survived on Papa John's pizza yeah. through college. <laughs> it was my primary order. It was what I, it was my go-to. Um, my taste changed a little bit as I got older, and now I don't buy from any of the main brands anymore. I buy from like the local places and stuff like that. Tell me a little bit about how the pizza business has changed and what makes a good pizza now and who you think is doing a good job and who's doing a bad job? Well, uh, I love small business and Papa John's is a family of small businesses, mm -hmm. three, four, five stores per franchisee. So um, when you uh, talk about the independent pizzerias, they really are my heroes. Papa John's started in the back of a bar in a broom closet. So I love the little guy. I'm a fighter for the independent pizzeria all the way to the bank. And that's what bothers me about COVID is, uh, it's been really hard on small business mm -hmm. and the small business owners. And so we've uh, we've set up over a million dollars worth of relief. And we've done a lot for small business to help uh, the folks that um, wake up every day and make this country great. I uh, That's one of the reasons that I focused on buying more from these small local eateries and the like as opposed to chains during this period. I know that there are a lot of people for whom – those places are really important. Yeah. And, and I've talked to various folks within the food industry who've actually said that they have, they're starting to have more confidence that those are going to be able to come back yeah. depending on the, the city and the area. How confident are you in that? And is this a situation where you know, uh, the, the smalls are the places that have been hit hardest and, and are going to be you know, really in a bad position when it comes to, to you know, trying to put everything together to get their doors open again when the bigs are the ones who can lobby Congress and the like. Yeah. Maybe in uh, other segments outside of pizza delivery, mm -hmm. um, the cost of entry, the barrier of entry for pizza delivery is $100,000, $125,000. And you're not going to break the American spirit. America is America because, you know, the entrepreneurs and the American spirit, you're just, you're not going to. So what's going to come out of this COVID disaster is a lot of innovation, um, a lot of new and better companies. And this is going to kind of weed out some of the weaker players. But with regards to pizzeria, the cost of entry is so low. And there's so many John Schnatters out there mm -hmm. that want to be in business for themselves. They want to be an entrepreneur that um, if, if independent pizzerias do close short term, they'll open up rather quickly just because of the cost of entry. Mm -hmm. You do a McDonald's or a Burger King or Wendy's and you're talking to me and a half two million dollars a store mm -hmm. you know uh, who's got a man and a half two million dollars for one restaurant pizzeria 100 150 grand mm -hmm. you're either you're open for business and you're good to go so I, I you know I'm completely out of Papa John's for that yes. very reason because the pizza had slipped so bad the quality had slipped mm -hmm. I was gonna say I'm curious as somebody who's run both a small business and a big corporation yeah if you have an opinion on what legislatively could be done right now that balances the needs of the small businesses and the big businesses because as we're starting to reflect on the initial aid package that Congress passed there's a question seriously to be asked about whether they prioritize the needs of corporate America over the small businesses are there steps that you think could be taken now that would balance that well um, to your point um, I think government Overregulation hurts small business, mm -hmm. and it makes it awfully hard when you overregulate. Um, the barriers to get in when you have, um, you know, Uncle Sam uh, constantly throwing roadblocks makes it very, very difficult. No doubt about it. I'm not big on a lot of government intervention because the government is so corrupt. Mm -hmm. I mean, to your point, uh, the lobbyists and everything else. You look at the pharmaceuticals. Um, you look at um, you know, the judicial system, lawyers, you look at doctors, it's, you know, it's a lot of bad stuff going on. But in this case, the PPE with small business, yes, you, you got to do it. You got to do everything you can do from a, a government point of view to uh, help that small business owner, help he or she get through this tough time. Now, <clears throat> are people going to play games and do things they shouldn't? 
Yeah. You got to hold your nose. Yeah. But you still got to give them the money. Mm-hmm. I know that there's a, you know, a drop off, as you mentioned, uh, in some of these areas when it comes to the quality of the pizza. I, I personally am curious about what you use as your metrics when you're analyzing <laughs> what makes a good pizza. And, and you know, particularly just before you even taste it, kind of looking at it, you can tell this one's not going to be as good as, as it ought to be or if it had done right. these different things differently. What are some of those key hang-ups? Well, the huge advantage that Papa John's had when I was there, you know, two, three years ago, was we ran it like a small business with regards to product and uh, people. Mm -hmm. I mean, we treated it like a family business, and yet we had the scale of a large business. So Mm -hmm. you had uh, the marketing, uh, the technology platform, uh, the support, the overhead, the distribution, the scale in buying, but at the same time, you had that passion for quality, which makes the independent pizzerias a difference that differentiate, differentiates them from the chains. <clears throat> We've lost that at Papa John's. Now, what I look for, um, I'm going to look for um, a thin crust, high gluten, thin crust. We cooked out of a deck oven uh, early on. I like a deck oven. Um, we got so big and so busy, it was kind of hard, but our product does really well in a convection oven, a belt oven. Uh, I'm going to want a fresh pack sauce. I don't want paste. I don't want remanufactured sauce. Um, I'm going to want real mozzarella or cheese made from real mozzarella. I like a little bit high on the moisture, which is a little bit cheaper. Cheese is probably the only ingredient we had in our product was a little bit less because we had a little more moisture. But if we didn't have that moisture, um, then the product would dry out and we lose that fresh pack sauce. And then the other ingredients, um, just the quality, what you you know, what you pay for is what you get. And um, uh, just the two pizzas that we just looked back there with Papa John's, um, they skimped on the cheese. When you skip, <laughs> I did. I'm like a pizza going, you go back, go right, go back, go, yeah. go back and grab the pizza. Yeah. And I'm looking at this going, see, cheese is the most inexpensive ingredient. Yeah. But if you don't put enough cheese on, the pizza dries out and it doesn't taste very good. Mm. So go look at those pizzas. They're dried out. I was kind of embarrassed. So <laughs> when you are making a pizza for yourself, Versus when you're making it, you know, in in a store, what do you do differently, maybe, than the product that you put out from a store? What's the thing that you invest more in, or the ingredient that you add that you know wouldn't be available uh, or would not be, you know, possible to put out in kind of a mass-produced way? Uh, we every pizza I made, I made it like I was making it for my family, mm-hmm. for my kids. Mm-hmm. Um, so I didn't if I. I knew a better way of making it. I would have been making every one of them that way with a Papa John. So uh, my favorite pizza is a pepperoni sausage, six cheese. But I always made the pizza for my guests the way that I would make it for myself. We had a, a, a marketing, um, a little bit of a campaign where it says, this is pizza I would feed my family. Mm-hmm. And it was truthful. Mm-hmm. <laughs> truthful. Well, I, I have to say that, you know, it's it's one of these things that is actually difficult i think for or people feel like in, they're intimidated by it making it at home they feel like you know they need to buy pizza stones or that they need to get you know particular things yeah. there's tons and tons of youtube videos i'm sure you've seen from various people trying to figure out how to replicate something or, or make it in a different way there, there was in fact an entire series i believe at, uh, at bon appetit a while back about trying to get the the perfect pizza basically mm-hmm. and they even flew two people to italy to figure out how to make <laughs> buffalo mozzarella mm-hmm. and most of the, they spent most of the time drinking their way across through that episode i have to say <laughs> wisely um to what would you say to someone who is a home chef who wants to start making pizza for their family about the things that they should do or the yeah. things that they shouldn't. Yeah, a little trivia. The um, pizza was not originated in um, Italy. No. Right. It was Egypt, the flatbread pizza. Yeah. In fact, they didn't have, um, I don't think they had tomatoes in Italy till Columbus in 1492. Mm-hmm. So, but the Italians kind of made it famous yeah. and then the New Yorkers took it from there. But, um, <laughs> and improved. Uh, what the Italians <laughs> <laughs> Well, we'll talk, yeah, I won't ask that question. <laughs> We can talk about it. <laughs> I'm German. Oh, yes. okay. I'm yes. German. But you don't have to be uh, French to be a good lover. So I, mean, <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't know how to make a good pizza. What are some of the other things that you would tell people about what they ought to do in the approach they ought to use? They take the raw ingredients, they take them home. How do they go about making them in a way? Yeah, the sauce, you can kind of get that right. Um, you know, mozzarella cheese, you can, you can pretty well get that right. 
Uh, the toppings, that's just personal preference. The the tough part is the, the dough. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, pizza dough is high gluten. Yeah. It simply means high protein. Um, and, you know, flour that you make cookies with is not going to make good pizza. So my, my recommendation is go find two or three pizzerias, buy all the ingredients raw, mm -hmm. come back, and then play with it and create your own pizza with other people's stuff. I guess you could go buy everybody's dough and then, you know, go to the grocery and buy your sauce or whatever you, you choose. But, you know, I, when I, when people want me to make pizzas at their house, I, the, the one thing I have to have is a decent oven and then I'll bring the dough myself because right. you can't get the pizza dough right at home. When, uh, when they want you to make pizzas at the house, do you get tired of it? <laughs> no. Do you, do you got, <laughs> it's, 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 it's saying you got to play the hits though. Like every time you got to play the hits, you might get, you might, you might get tired of the hits. You might say, can I make some pasta or something? Well, <laughs> I, we were out in Montana a couple months ago and, um, you know, on vacation and joined and a friend of mine, Jordan Zimmerman says, Hey, you know, we want you to make pizzas at the house. Well, I'm like, you know, it's not quite that easy. And, right. and, and Papa John's coming, it's just magical. I just make a perfect pizza. So, we hit ever independent pizzeria in Bozeman, Montana, and uh, guy asked, the guy at the uh, top of the hill at Yellowstone had a pizza oven that was like unbelievable, and he had a little light that you can get the temperature, and so I could get the brick hot. So we made really good pizza out of independent pizzerias, dough and stuff at uh, at a house. But you got to work at it. You got to think about it. You're just not going to show up and make a good pizza at somebody's home. Mm. So I think we both, Emily and I, wanted to get into some of the conversation about uh, your own perspective and experience when it comes to the culture war in America. There's, I think, an increasing awareness on the part of Americans broadly that the views that they express, especially if they express them in ways that people can mischaracterize, can lead to them being effectively canceled, that their small business can be affected, that their uh, livelihoods can be affected, their careers altered. In fact, we have poll data on this from the past year from our uh, friend and, and uh, uh, colleague over at Cato Institute, Emily Eakins, who did a ton of research that basically produced a huge chunk of America's uh, uh, people, including people who are of all classes and all backgrounds, are scared of sharing their views on subjects, including political subjects, but other subjects as well. They're afraid of talking, period. Yes, and that they will have ramifications for sharing those views uh, in ways that completely you know, can, can damage their livelihoods and their lives. Uh, I think that we feel that you've gone through something that's been very you know, terrible and public and very unfair, but I also feel like you have to have had a little bit of distance now to kind of think back on it. What are the lessons that you take away from that experience? And what do you think about the fact that so many Americans now feel like they're just as much in the spotlight for their views in their workplace or what have you as someone who was, you know, the CEO of a major company? Um, I think entrepreneurship is about what y'all just had me do. Mm. Getting somebody's opinion or insight, you know, so if you make a pizza at home, try, you know, some other folks crust and mix it up a little bit. Just know that the tough part of the equation is the dough. We just did it in real time. That's what an entrepreneur does. An entrepreneur is always trying to find a faster, better, innovative, quicker, whatever it is, way to do something because that makes other people's lives better. Um, you know, Steve Jobs with the phone, you know, uh, Ford with the car, uh, Musk, don't tell him what that guy's going to do. You know, he's going to do something great and it's right. going to make all our lives better. Um, that is thinking out of the box. Mm -hmm. That is having a different way to look at reality, a different way of looking at life. And so I get very uneasy and frightened when I see the, the paradigm, if you don't have a certain ideology and if you don't think the way I think, then we're going to persecute you. Um, you know, I hear all this about diversity. Okay, fine. But or against diversity of thought. Right. Duh. Mm -hmm. I mean, why are you not, you know, the, the saying is, if I don't challenge your judgment, I weaken you. And if you don't challenge my judgment, you weaken me. Mm -hmm. That's a healthy dialogue. Now, I'm not saying when you do it in a way that is destructive and you're trying to tear the other person down. I don't like that. But when it's collaborative confrontation and the line of question is to make other people better, or make society better, um, 
I think that's really good, healthy, and I think that's what's made America America. And the thought of shutting that down because somebody doesn't think the way I do or I don't think the way they do is basically taking away our our First Amendment rights. I mean, our Second Amendment rights. I mean, it's just our First Amendment rights, you know, uh, freedom of speech. I mean, you don't want to lose that. I mean, that is the backbone of, backbone of America. That's why we came over here is we weren't allowed to talk. Right. <laughs> Uh, diversity, you mentioned the word diversity, and that is a huge corporate buzzword. And I think so much of this is coming from corporate America because people who are maybe my age, uh, millennials, graduated from these colleges that were teaching all of these lessons on diversity and then imported them into the corporate world and are now pressuring executives and people in leadership of corporations to um, you know, follow their standards that they maybe learned at Oberlin or something like that. And I'm curious for your take, um, do you see this and, and have you seen this sort of creeping into the corporate world in a way that's having a, a chaotic effect or a stressful effect on all of these companies' abilities just to do business and let entrepreneurs be entrepreneurs and be creative and um, economically productive? So the, the question is... Are, are millennials ruining the workforce? No. <laughs> uh, my question is, is there this like sort of far leftist ideology that's showing up more and more like in human resource departments or anywhere else? Um, no doubt. The, the diversity, you know, you got to have a VP of diversity. Right. Um, you know, if you were, you got to be really, you got to have optics that you look like you're trying to do something with diversity, mm. um, whether it's working or not. You know, I've been out of corporate America for three years. We never had a problem with that because, in my opinion, it starts at the top. Right. And I would never tolerate any bias or prejudice with regard to heritage, uh, skin color, gender, sexual preferences, et cetera. I mean, I, I would not have tolerated that. That was just our culture, the way we, we ran it. And you put all the programs you want in the world. But if you if you really are not walking the talk, I mean, let's take there was a company that was really famous. And, got big and their core values were ethics, uh, integrity, quality and service. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the company was Enron. <laughs> <laughs> and so you can well, Google's yeah, is yeah, yeah. Evil. So you put all this <laughs> you put all this stuff on the wall and then you're playing games and you're not really being ethical yeah. and, and and walking the talk. And so we you know I see corporate boards, they're lazy. Mm -hmm. They really don't know what's going on. They're professionals, you know, they it's kind of what they do. They sit on two or three boards and you know they hit their four or five meetings a year. They don't. They don't know what's going on. But if they oh, we'll put a diversity officer in place, and that'll look good. It'll have good optics, and it'll make everything okay. And I'm not sure that really solves the problem. Mm -hmm. The uh, need, I think, for uh, there to be an open conversation about all these subjects that are so contentious in American life has never been greater. And yet, the the effort on the part of woke corporate environments seems to be designed to shut down any kind of discussion mm -hmm. um, and in particular to uh, i would say skew this discussion in certain ways where it basically share, scares people away from sharing what they really think about something mm -hmm. well if you look at um you look at uh, communist china mm -hmm. communism socialism usually but communism they um, they restrict your talk and they restrict the media and they're, you only put out what pe you want people to hear, which is exactly what um, Google and Facebook did in this election. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, I mean, that's one click away from communism. I mean, yeah. You really think about it. I mean, one of the things that we're talking about, you know, just in, in the advance of you coming in here was the experience that we had of seeing the, the revelations about Hunter Biden this week kind of come back in and, and be... Uh, uh, again, now something that we can talk about, where the AP and the Washington Post and the New York Times kind of have to cover it because we now know that you know actually there is an investigation going on. He is you know under investigation for a lot of different things, and that creates this weird environment where there was this thing that nobody was allowed to talk about, um, nobody was allowed to share, uh, and now you know it's it's going to be something that even more people dig into. But if you were paying attention to one of these corporate media platforms. Uh, that was you know, very dominant, you probably didn't get any information about it. And that's something that is very concerning to us in the media. Is there something similar going on, you feel, in, in corporate America where you have to kind of uh, go along and toe the line of whatever you know, the 
the most woke person in the room is saying. That basically it's the it's that extreme opinion that determines what conversation is even allowed. Well, we'll take we'll pick on the Trump campaign mm-hmm. for a second. Um, you know, they're complaining that uh, it was a fix, mm-hmm. you know, it was a host uh, that the the fix was in and that the data was, you know, manip- manipulated and it was unfair. But, you know, you look at social media. Well, I guess Twitter, I guess their kind of fix was in. And you look at mainstream media. Um, well, they didn't even hide it. No. Uh, they didn't. They didn't. Uh, yeah, I guess you could say the fix was in. You, you look at the judicial system, you know, and well. Well, Sullivan, well, I guess you could say, mm-hmm. well, take some as far, oh, let's do pharmaceuticals. Mm-hmm. Oh, the, oh, the week after election, we found a cure for COVID. Oh, <laughs> well, I guess you could say the fix was in. Um, so <laughs> look at academia. <laughs> yeah. I guess you could kind of say, so it, there's, it's so blatant and mm-hmm. so obvious that it's, it's comical and they don't really try to hide it. Uh, the problem you get with corporate boards is they're very weak. Mm-hmm. And... Um, the which is kind of sad because they have the utmost protection. You can sit on the corporate board and be brain dead, you know. And some <laughs> and some of Redmond was, by the way, and a few others. Um, and but as long as you don't violate your duty of care, your duty of loyalty, the duty of loyalty says you got to put the shareholders first. Duty of care says you got to think about things before you make a decision. They can't come after you. I mean, you know, Delaware law really protects boards. So why these board members cave in to politics and um, the the PAC mentality? Let's go along with it because, you know, we it's it's what everybody else is doing. Uh, a is that is a weak individual, which mm-hmm. most people are. They're not principle centered. And to that point, B is if you're not principle centered and you don't know right from wrong, then you shouldn't be on a corporate board to begin with. Mm-hmm. And that's probably been the most disappointing thing with Papa John's. I've watched board members that are supposed to be the pillars of their community and leaders of the community mm-hmm. and integrity and all this. And they come across an issue and they're just, they're not truthful. They're not, they don't act with integrity. And it's like, wow, they're like built, they're like built like paper dolls. And that's what we saw with this whole uh, craziness with laundry service. I mean, laundry service and some of the board members set me up and we had a media frenzy on frenzy on a false narrative. And instead of backing up and saying, hey, let's get a special committee. Let's do an investigation. Let's see what he really said. Mm-hmm. Let's slow the train down here and follow good corporate governance. They panicked, you know, pulled the ripcord and, and blew it up. So um, I, I think it always is going to come back to if you don't have principles, you don't have anything. What's so strange to me is that oftentimes we see corporations be responsive to very small Twitter mobs. So they may seem like they're a big deal on Twitter or on Facebook, but in reality, uh, social media is not always reality. And so you have this like loud mob of far leftists who, if, if anybody fails to toe the line for one minute, whether it's a CEO, um, somebody on the board, somebody in leadership, you have the small group of people freak out on Twitter but the corporations respond to them and they cave. And that to me is the one thing I struggled to really understand, which is that you'd think, you know, for public relations purposes, all of these small dust ups on social media are storms you can weather if you just don't respond. And so from the outside perspective, somebody who doesn't work at a major corporation, I guess I'm struggling to understand why, why they give in. You know, I think it's, they're just weak mm-hmm. and they're not principally based and um, they're not in it to do the right thing. They're in it to, you know, I guess make a buck or to say they sit on that board or what have you, but it's very unhealthy. Um, and it sets a really bad example for our, our youth. Mm-hmm. Um, that's what's going on that, okay, we if we're not happy with the decisions, we tear towns up or we still tear stores up or fronts or statues and and by the way and they got and they got elected mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. i mean that's like a three-year-old child that when well, they don't get candy that throw a temper tantrum and by the way so now you give them the candy i mean why why would you uh, put people in office that are destroying our towns mm-hmm. and you know because you're scared they're going to tear the towns up more I, that's that's kind of sad but the species seems to evolve somehow, some way, a higher level of functioning. It sure doesn't feel like it right now when we're all fighting amongst each other, but I, I think we have to, hopefully, this will somehow, some way through evolution will promote a higher level of consciousness and, you know, hopefully spirituality where 
this beating each other up and tearing each other down and division, we certainly sooner or later we got to realize that's the wrong way to go. Mm. It's just not healthy. Um, the I do want to get back to pizza, mm -hmm. um, uh, and I do want to talk about controversies within that space uh, before we uh, uh, let you go. Uh, I put out uh, some a couple of different questions to people. Uh, in advance of this, and the biggest thing right off the bat is that everyone just immediately started arguing whether Chicago pizza is pizza. <laughs> wow. My answer is yes. She's a Midwesterner. As a Midwesterner, my answer is yes. So I, so that's her opinion on this. So, <laughs> so but we have some New Yorkers. So. What, what's your hometown? Uh, well, I was born in Jackson, Mississippi, and I grew up in South Noted Carolina. Noted pizza capital. Where did you go to college? Uh, I went to William and Mary. Okay. Okay. Good. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I went to school in DC. DC. Yeah, yeah. Is Chicago real pizza? Heck yeah. <laughs> um, yes. I'll give you. I'll give you. I'll give you. I'll give you the arithmetic. On okay. It. All right. All right. <clears throat> Fresh back sauce is the key to the flavor. Sauce is forty percent of the flavor profiles. Okay. Um, Forty years ago, eighty percent of the sauce out there was fresh back, and twenty percent was remanufactured paste because paste is half the money. Today, eighty percent is paste because mm. it's cheaper, and twenty percent is a uh, real fresh pack sauce from the vine to the can in less than six hours. Chicago and New York use 97% of the country's fresh pack sauce. Mm. So you're damn right they make a good pizza in Chicago and they make a good pizza in New York because they both use fresh pack sauce. <laughs> <laughs> That's, and arithmetic is not an opinion. That's the oh opinion. Oh my gosh. <laughs> That's the opinion. That That's was the incredible math. So, so the people, I, I have to at least try to make an argument on behalf of the New Yorkers who would be screaming at you right now, saying that what they sell in Chicago is not pizza. It is it is a form of of pie, like a bread heavy, sauce heavy pie that uh, that has pizza like characteristics <laughs> and has no resemblance to an actual slice. You know, New Yorkers the the thin pizza, raised yeah. pizza. Uh, they're going to use a thin pizza. They're going to cook on a deck oven, probably a baker fried. They're going to use grande cheese, which is a high protein, real thick, buttery cheese. It's a great pizza. Chicago, they're going to they're going to have a deep dish pizza. You know, it's going to be it's all about the bread. So to say one's better than the other, I think you know it depends on you know what day of the week is and what kind of mood you are. Some people like thin. We found out that it was about a third, a third thin, a third traditional, a third pan pizza. Mm. So, um, but New York probably a lot more folks so yeah. they're going to have a, a, a bigger vote but chicago does make great deep dish pizza no doubt about it i agree have you paid uh <laughs> much attention to uh, uh barstool's dave portnoy's the way yeah, he yeah. approaches pizza reviews right i like um, that uh you that's what i was going to ask do you like his method of, of reviewing should he do something like should he do something differently i have i have one critique that i'll offer which is just that he reviews pizza uh immediately after he orders it right uh, there is no wait time. Mm. And so from my perspective, the one defect of his reviews is that I am typically ordering that pizza. I'm not, I don't have the ability of a New Yorker to necessarily just walk to the place, go to the place, get it. I'm ordering it. And so it's going to sit in the car for, yeah. you know, gosh, knows. and that changes things. It changes the outcome. That was my, my that would be my one critique. What do you do you think that his methods are good? Well, I, I look at his success, mm -hmm. you know, I look at the, the economics and, you know, how he's doing. But I saw him about two months ago down in Miami and I'm on a 22 foot boat with buddies fishing and he goes by in about a 200 foot boat with 30 girls on the boat. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, I don't I mean, I don't know, you know, I, I guess I just don't have what it takes. So I, the guy's doing, the guy's doing something right. So I think, but I, Hey, it works. I think it's entertaining. I think he's funny. Um, he's certainly Dave is Dave. So, and he's got a 200 foot boat with 130 yeah. feet, man, whatever he's got on it. So. Uh, if his focus is obviously primarily, but not exclusively, uh, New York, New Jersey area, uh, you know, small pizza, independent pizza places. Do you have a favorite independent pizza place in New York? If you go and visit New York, is there a place you stop by? I like to go by Ray's and get a slice of pizza. Mm -hmm. You know, it used to be a lot more, but, you know, it's quick. You can get it by the slice. It's good, you know, fast on the way out of town. Mm -hmm. um, my favorite independent pizzeria is Creek's Pizzeria. Okay. Yeah. They're where's, my favorite. Where is that? They're uh, founded in Muncie, Indiana by Chris Caramassini, the Greek. He's kind of my mentor. Okay. Uh, but he makes a mean pizza. Okay. Yeah. What does he do differently at that? 
okay, he taught me this. He, uh, <laughs> he actually um, uses real tomatoes, grinds them up, and then adds a little, um, adds a little sugar, a little sweetener, and makes it kind of a sweet sauce. That's where I got the idea for the sweet sauce at Papa John's. And I got to tell you, out in uh, Leesburg, okay. Rocco's. Now, what um, what they do at Rocco is they put a little honey in the butter, mm -hmm. some honey in the bread, mm -hmm. in the dough. Gosh, damn, yeah, it's good. It's good. <laughs> I mean, I, we had one yesterday, and uh, Rocco's makes them eat pizza with honey in the dough. In fact, I wish I'd have told you that because I'm going to steal that next time I uh, start to <laughs> put a little honey in the dough. Did you have anything else? No, I mean, the sweet sauce is my favorite component of the Papa John's yeah. pizza. And I think something that's so interesting about your approach to pizza is that it seems to be very mathematical. You seem to look at the pizza as sort of like the, the, it's a numbers game. <laughs> the percentages of paste versus, you know, all the fresh ingredients and moisture in the mozzarella. It's amazing. It's think, an equation. I think you've got me pegged. I have a sweet tooth <laughs> with that sauce and I'm analytical and you're right. Um, you know, uh, 14 inch pizza has eight slices. 48 pepperonis at six a slice. I expect six slices on every pizza. I don't so I'm probably a little bit... Uh, <laughs> I guess I'm a little anal when it comes to, you know, mathematics. So, yeah. <laughs> but that's that's often what makes the difference. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I want to ask uh, one more uh, question, which is just about uh, uh, fast food generally uh, or ordered food. Uh, this has been a moment in America where so many more people were, uh, you know, both cooking at home and then ordering, uh, ordering out as opposed to going out. Um, in terms of the experience that you've had or that, that you've seen, kind of going on across the industry, has this been a, a moment where quality has dramatically declined or whether the amount of, of interest has actually led to an increase in quality because people could tell the difference that, you know, they need to get the ordering thing down right in the era of, of DoorDash and Uber Eats and all of these places. Um, I do think with carry out, especially in full service restaurants, it's more difficult to control yeah. the quality. It's interesting you, you say that we, we study this. And we studied like Jets Pizza. Jets makes a great pizza. Mm -hmm. And what we've noticed is Jets through this pandemic is used pizza, used a sampling as a way to build trial and build their business. Mm -hmm. So Jets Pizza is going to come out of this way ahead. Papa John's, their quality slipped quite a bit. Mm -hmm. um, and they, they lost all their good people. And you got people running it that don't know anything about the pizza business. I think... The worst place you can be in 2021 is probably a franchisee for Papa John's. Mm -hmm. So because they haven't taken advantage of this with their quality, I think they've exposed uh, the consumer to a bad experience. But when you got a monopoly, when you got a captive audience because you're in the pizza delivery business, you can get away with it. So let's see what happens in the next six months. Mm -hmm. You you teased last question. You teased the possibility of, of whatever you do next. What is whatever you do next going to be uh, pizza focused? And if so, do you want to use this opportunity to talk crap about any of the other people <laughs> in your area? Domino's, Pizza Hut, <laughs> Little Caesars, if you want to. <laughs> get... No, I mean, hey, uh, hell yeah, I want to talk crap about other people. <laughs> <laughs> Are you kidding? No, I've had professional management training. I'm not, not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. Pizza um, diversity. No, we, the, That's you know, we. we... <laughs> oh, they <pizza>. got to. <laughs> That's too funny. Um, no, but we've, uh, we've just, it's been a blessing up to now. It really has been a great ride. Um, we started a broom closet, built 5,000 stores, you know, we've created so many millionaires and, you know, they really are the key the, the team's been the key to our success and it's just been a real blessing. I think it's going to be even better the next 20 years. I don't know what that better is. I just know it's going to be better and I'm thankful for that ahead of time. The four criteria, it's got to be part of my soul. How I'm wired, you spotted a few. I got a little sweet tooth. I like analytics. I got a passion for quality. It's got to be part of me, too. It's got a better humanity. It just has to. Uh, I can't, I don't want to be, I started in the bar business and I hate it because it was hard on marriages. It was hard on families. I didn't mm -hmm. like the bar business. Three is it has to be scalable. I like big stuff. I like big and fourth, it has to be sustainable. It has to be pay for itself. So mm -hmm. that's my four criteria for my next venture. Wish me luck. Good luck. Good luck. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Well, thanks for taking the time to yeah. join us today, Papa John. Good to talk. Thank you, Ben. Thank you, Emily. Absolutely. Have a great day. I'm Ben Dominic. You've been mm. listening to another edition mm. of the Federalist Radio Hour. We'll be back soon with more. Until then, be lovers of freedom and anxious for the fall.